today's presentation is going to be lighting the road ahead and like I said uh, glad you're doing good Ryan yeah <laughs> we've had some real crappy weather here we were just talking about that hello everybody uh, if you notice too, today uh, it's going to be commercial motor vehicle lighting in the road ahead. And uh, I don't want it to be a misnomer. I'm, I'm hoping I can make it more than just, hey, I'm going to turn the light on and, uh, you know, my lights come on. And uh, I'm going to not try to make it complicated, but this wound up as I was putting it together quite a few, quite a nice little vehicle to get into a little bit of multiplexing because that's one of the issues we have with lights today is not it's not like the years ago you just pull a bulb out and bingo you go you know it's getting uh, quite complicated and i'll get into it quite a bit a little bit more hopefully we'll, we'll have a little talk about it and of course predominantly your uh the type of lighting you see out there today is leds you know so that's that's a little bit of a game changer too when it comes to diagnostics do me a favor bobby just so everybody knows what we're going to get uh, put it over the board so nobody leaves early you know just pan through we're gonna use this we're gonna use this board over here uh, I'm gonna do some stuff just like I did last week you know maybe I like the hands off hands on stuff guys you know that's more fun and if you go over here of course we're gonna have do some stuff over here so I don't want my presentations to be click 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 here's the PowerPoint so let's get into it a little bit okay. Now, got to click through the slides. This, of course, I, I keep saying everybody, you know, don't even pan in there. You know, it's me. Hopefully, what we get across will be more into uh, you walk away with something because they really, that at the end of the day, that's what you want to do. You know, so and I'm kind of half watching the chat board. Thank, thank you again, guys, for coming here and watching. Uh, what are we going to cover? We're going to cover a brief overview of lighting regulations, description, operation, various types of lights and circuits, diagnosing light issues from simple systems to multiplex systems. Okay, and that that multiplex system that really has been a game changer. Keep in mind too, I'm I'm limited to only have an hour to do a lot of this stuff. I mean, multiplexing and controllers can be a whole day thing, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. So from before we get into any of this, from last month diagnostic, those of you who were there, I had this last video on, and I'm going to put it on in case you guys missed it. And my question was, it would kind of teaser get you guys to come back on over here. So let me replay from the last video from last month. Okay. And my question was, what do you guys see? And last month. There was a couple of guys that were pretty close answering. Uh, I, th I believe one of the guys said about uh, he recognized it as a CNG truck, and I'm sure he did that because at the back of the truck in that picture I had, you saw the big compartment for the CNG tanks and everything. But the thing was, you, you were awful, awful close. Basically, what happened was, and I'll click this forward real fast, was this has a pressure regulator. So if you look over here, you got a couple coolant lines over here, okay? Because all I can say is, listen, CNG does not like cold weather, okay? So they want to make sure everything is right. If you have propane tanks, you know what I'm talking about. If that's how you use to heat your house and everything else, you know. But anyway basically you're taking high pressure gas and you want to make sure that you wind up getting low pressure gas out if any of you guys work on forklifts you don't necessarily have to work on this the concept concepts are basically the same okay and what happened was over here you can see these systems they really when you fill it up okay you full gas in here you're going to wind up going up to roughly around 38 hundred pounds 3,800 pounds and this other slide basically this was to fix inside that box that's the regulator I showed you okay in the process of course you know me I keep talking about the real world I can stand here all day long you put your wrench on a fitting it'll pop off and everything else and you know that's not gonna happen I mean this crap is out there in our weather with all the calcium chloride on the roads and my gosh you ain't getting those fittings out so constantly snap 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 that means you know what 
why might as well put new hoses on but anyway that's what was going on from last week so now we're gonna get into uh, uh, yeah a lot a lot of good you know uh, I'm not sure how many guys uh, Gino hello how you doing I'm not sure how many guys get into uh, CNG but uh, I know uh, there's talk that that to be honest with you that should have been probably a transition type of a fuel you know because we're, we're you know everyone wants to go into electric and it's it's we're just not quite ready to go into it you know so I'm I think you know they're missing the boat with that but let's get back on this now I've done a lot of the regulation stuff here and everything and the annual inspection so for those of you that watched it this is kind of like a just a little refresher you know we're, we're talking about commercial motor vehicles so you're gonna have to you really regulate it when it comes into lights so a little refresher here lighting requirements are found in federal motor carrier safety regulations typically they're in that part 393 and if you're not comfortable with this please go on the dormant lunch and learn you'll see the previous recordings I walk through some of this stuff but in that regulation it starts from 393.9 to 393 3.30 okay and again you're gonna have the handouts over here you know and these are requirements and of course they become part of our periodic uh, inspection requirement that winds up being in appendix A I got appendix G I forgot to change it to appendix A now these requirements derive from Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 571.108. Now, I, I don't care if it's a light for a motorcycle, if it's a light for your car, for your pickup truck, or the tractor trailer, whatever. It's this Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards that really sets the standards. So when that light goes on that vehicle, it has to meet those standards, you know, whether it be for Candela, for Lumens, you know, all that stuff and it's found in there. So if you ever get a chance, it's a quite a big section. It basically winds up being about, uh, has a lot to do with the manufacturer has to meet these requirements. So now, Appendix A require all lighting devices required by Part 393 to be operative. Now, if you're in the commercial motor vehicles, you know you've got another set of rules. It's called uh, uh, out of service criteria and it kind of gives you a little bit of a leeway uh, basically out of service means if you have some defects that are so bad okay, the officer is gonna say hey you know what pull that vehicle over there and you're gonna sit there until somebody comes and fixes it okay but you get a little bit of leeway so for example one stoplight functioning turn signal on the rearmost vehicle of a combination vehicle to be operative at all times addition one operative headlamp and taillight are required during the hours of tightness i always tell if i do something with companies with lights i tell them if you want to have spare stuff in there what is that absolutely bulb that you want to have in your vehicle if you're a driver absolutely whatever takes care of your turn signal or your tail light or headlight at least have one at least you still be able to roll if you have all of those out or any one of those two out you're done so if that makes sense all right now this is where it starts because in commercial motor vehicles we're also contended with hooking up to that trailer okay part of your annual inspections you get pulled over in the roadside and of course me being not a wise guy but including you guys over here okay what do you got over here okay a crappy looking seven-way plug it's the little things you know this guy's going up and down the road and of course when he's going up and down the road that plug moves up and down and of course you're gonna lose connection and stuff and driver might not even realize it because after all this is what we're doing with commercial vehicles now this is something I will guarantee you that most guys do not uh, do not realize you know what's with these lights remember I mentioned federal motor vehicle safety standards okay now to most people a marker light looks like a marker light a clearance light looks like a clearance light and so on and so on okay first of all you always need to get comfortable rear identification IDs the three red lamps what the hell is this P2 or P3 rated okay and I'll get to that in a minute. top center space 60 inches those are the requirements now on the side over here the rear clearance lamp two red lamps p2 pc or p3 pc2 rated 
mounted at widest point symmetrically on the rear near the rear facing rear end, as high as practical but I want to hang my head on this P2 PC here for a minute now what happens is you'll see words like this photometrically certified at installation angle the angle is crucial here so let's walk through this these are ID codes that most guys that in our industry don't even realize exists. P2 clearance sight mark ID lamp. This marking found on lamps is currently used for both over 80 inch and under 80 inch vehicles. It seems to be the standard for under 80 inch. Again, I mentioned 108 Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard. They have not indicated increased requirement for larger width P2. P3 clearance sight marker identification lights for use on vehicles over 8 inch wide. A P3 designated lamp has a higher light output, okay, and there it is. P3 has a higher light output than a P2 rated lamp. It is legal wherever a P2 rated light would be used. Not all manufacturers make lights to meet the P3 standard. So bear with me, okay, it'll make sense in a second. Now this is the guy. The PC, combination side marker clearance lamp rectification, vehicles over 8 inches. For this PC rated lamp to be used as a combination light, the lights have to be mounted on a 45 degree bevel. What am I talking about? Combination light. Typically, you would have a light over here in the corner here and you'd also have a clearance over here. Well, if you have a 45 degree angle, eliminate this guy here or this guy here, and you can put this PC rated light right in that corner over here. You meet all the requirements of the law. That's what this is all about. Eh? PC2 meet an increased angle output or design as combination. They must be mounted on a 45 degree bevel corner when used as combination lamp, okay? Now, just so you know, another myth. Federal Motor v uh, Vehicle Safety Standard 108 does not require these lens markings with the exception they accept DOT lettering as certifying legal compliance. However, companies like Truck Light engraved their name in SOT. So what I wanna do, just so you know from the get-go, uh, a lot of my stuff over here, uh, I've had truck light, they've worked with me really great for years. Uh, that board that you saw over there, I walked to it. It's a board I put, I got about two of those boards that they donated a lot of stuff for me to do this tech com competition I do every year. So they've been very helpful, you know, with that kind of, I got some good companies out there. So you'll see a few slides, you know, pertaining with truck light lights because we're going to talk about LEDs and they really are huge into LEDs. So I just wanted to get out of the way. But also at the same time, real fast, just so you guys know, this is not about selling parts. This is absolutely not about selling parts. You guys got to make the choices. But I think I can do a good justice, let everybody know too, that, you know, Torman Products, who provides all this training here, they, in the heavy duty, have a lot of parts here. Actually, they have some OEM direct replacement for the whole headlight assemblies, okay? And also some of the switches we're talking about. So, again, it's, it's, it's nice to know these people are out there to do, you know, to be on your side, and they've been doing it for years. So now let me get back to this. Now this picture, it is courtesy of truck light, shows that two P-rated lamps are required in this corner. So if you see the corner of that vehicle here, you know, you're looking at it from the roof over here. Eh? You need a light over here, you need a light over here. Everybody good so far on that? Okay. It projects light at a 90 degree angle, two required, one mounted on each top and front per side. Now. Here comes Mr. PC. What this PC did, like if you put it on a 45 degree angle, you can see over here, you know, I'm actually photometrically allowing the person that's driving next to you or from a distance away at nighttime be able to see this because isn't that what the purpose of the light anyway for clearance? Oh my gosh, I'm approaching a big trailer over there. How do I know? Look at that, clearance lights on both sides over there. Now the other thing too is, and, if, and this is what made me put together a whole PowerPoint just on lighting, not this one, but another one for enforcement people, 
is that here's another thing. If you put just one over here, you're still okay. You're going across the corner over here. So now, the next thing is, you might ask yourself, why would I be concerned? Okay. Most people don't realize, first of all, that these PC lights exist. So if you, I'll give you an example over here. Let me pull these two out. Okay. I'll be right back in front over there. You don't, have to, you don't have to move the camera. So what happens is, everybody's gone into these LED bullet lights, right? I'm sure, I mean, by now, if you're into trucking, you're really, <laughs> you're really into it. You change these as a, you know, constantly. So what happens is if I face them this way, they both look the same, don't they? Okay. No matter how I cut it, they look the same. Okay? Now, if you can hone in a little bit, okay? if you can hone in a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, I'll try to, that's good enough. Okay. I'm, I'm going to try to put them up a little bit. I'll try to get them even close to each other, okay? You'll see a kind of a hump on this one here. The lens is a little bit different, and if you get a side view, they're a little bit different. My point being is they both look the same. So if you pull this PC light off that corner because that was the requirement in our previous, I'll pick, flip it back, in our previous slide over here, you're going to go to a parts store and you're going to say, hey, give me, you got a bullet light like this? Absolutely. Okay. So a guy's going to give you this light over here. You're going to put it in there. Not that this has ever happened, but you always want to cover thigh ass. Let's put it this way. So one of these days, maybe this vehicle will get in an accident or something. All it takes is one person to say, it's like, I didn't see that trailer, you know. And the trailer the guy driving the trailer says, well, I had my lights on, but I did not, the way I was approaching, I did not see the clearance light, okay? You know, you get a juries out there that don't have a clue what a light even is, but what about somebody that hires insurance company, hires an investigator and say, well, you know what? We got to follow through on this. That person made a statement. And what if that investigator knows about P2, P3s, and PCs goes up there? Oh, look at this. There's a P2 in there. It should have had a PC. Okay? So, you know, that's the point I was trying to make with these lights over here with the PC. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time with a lot of this stuff. Uh, if you go in your federal regulation books, if you ever have any doubts that vehicle comes into your shop and you're trying to figure out should it, uh, is this the correct light, is it there, is it not, the federal regulation, federal motor carrier safety regulation book has all these pictures in there, okay? I mean, if, I, if you haven't seen me do, uh, if you haven't seen me do a regulation class, but this is what this is about. You know, I mean, I mean this is your Bible. I'm gonna re-emphasize it again. If you work on commercial motor vehicles, this is your Bible for inspections. If you're a driver, this tells you how to drive, what kind of licenses you need to have, what are your do's and don'ts, it has your hours of service in there, and it's fairly thick, okay? But I'm always amazed, I, I guarantee you that probably I, I can't pick a number, but with all the trainings I've done throughout the years, I bet you do probably 95% of the people there in the industry have never gone into this book. Yet everything that you wanted to know about, in our section 393, you have the lights, steering, tire, suspension, you name it, anything to do with the mechanical end. And, you know, and there's a section part 396 that deals with the inspections, you know. But anyway, you can see if you get into that book and i have a huge chart i didn't bring it out over here pictorial chart but it will actually you cannot go wrong okay should i have had a light here should i have it over here how high should it be you know what's the level of it you know what's my minimum height from ground 15 to 72 inches what color should they be it's right there you just gotta read okay? And here over again, another example, rear side marker lamps, minimum two red lamps, each side rear as far as practical, hide from ground, 15 to 60 inches, no maximum for eight inches. SAE lens code, P2, PC, or P3, PC2. So that's telling you right now, 
any one of those lights I'm okay with. Let me, and I got to back up a little bit, okay? Now, a lot of these lights, and it was hard to read, but <laughs> I'm not going to bring the magnifying glass, but the majority of lights, like when they come from truck light, they will have the P2, PC markings right on there, even though it's not necessarily required, okay? So, you know, and you'll have it over here. If you look someplace over here. So if you have, you think you have a reflective light, that's okay. You know, we're not, yeah, you, you'll see the lens. See over here, housing PC, lens PC. Okay, that's an example. But what happens is that, uh, where was I going with this? You know, again, outside of the headlights you don't necessarily need to have those markings on there you know but they put all the markings on there just so you know what you're going with so back to this if you ever have any doubts and you're doing an inspection you know there it is go in the book you cannot go wrong okay uh i just real fast corner my sae code a code a the other thing is you might get a light over there. It's like, gee, aren't I supposed to have a reflector over here? Well, yes, you are. But if your light says A on it, okay, and I don't know if I have anything here like this. Let's see, P1, PC, okay. This one doesn't say A on it. But if I see an A on it, this light will definitely be a combination light as it'll act as a light and also as a reflector. So again, like I said, hopefully you walk away with some stuff you might not have realized before, okay. Intermediate side markers. And again, I noticed that you've got a handout. Is there a max for clearance? Marker light as a max for what? Is there a maximum for clearance marker lights? You know, I'll, I'll try to keep monitoring the chats, but you guys know I get a little. Just let me know is there a oh, number of lights? No, that what happens is, and it's spelled out in 393.9. Okay, what happens is. The required lights is what you're concerned with. Okay? So it actually says in the book, and uh, that's a very good question. Let me, so I don't go wrong. What they're concerned about is that all the required lights, okay, uh, to save us a little time, I'm, I, I know it by heart. It, there's a 393.9 in that book says that. If you put that vehicle on the road, or if you do an annual inspection, all the required lights have to work. Okay, so if you add on, I don't care how many more lights you want, you want, you want to get a Christmas tree on the side or anything else. Okay, that does not count. Okay? What counts is you do an inspection, the vehicle gets pulled over, the required lights have to work. If that other light isn't working that you decided to add on, and you guys know what I'm talking about. You get all the uh, guys with 30 lights on the side of the trailer and everything. They look like a Christmas tree going up and down the road. Okay, if one of them is out, technically it's like, who cares? But if the one that's actually required is out, then it's a violation. Okay, if that, may, if that answers your question. Okay. And of course, the one reason that you're able to do a lot of these lights, just so you know, is we have gone into the LEDs today, and the LEDs open up a whole new world. They, they really don't draw hardly any juice is the wrong word to say. I give you, you know, we need to get used to using the right words, you know. Doesn't draw any amps, okay? They're in milliamps. They're not much amps at all. So consequently, you can put as many lights as you want. Now back to this, of course, you've got conspicuity and so on. Again, you need to get comfortable. And there's, for every kind of type or style of vehicle, it's in that book, guys and gals. It will, you know, you cannot go wrong. And then there's a table that goes along with these numbers here and you check the number up you check the table and it'll tell you exactly what you need to do you know so 
Again, this is just an example, rear side marker lamps, P2, PC, or PC3. Look, I'm gonna tell you right now, when, every time I do this with a PC and stuff like that, I even have parts houses, or well, what's a PC and stuff? Never even realized that that's important. Yes, it is, it's very, very important, because again, I held those bullet lights up, and they will look exactly the same, okay? You just need to make sure you're putting the right one on. Now, in your handouts, again, you have what I went through real fast, plus also get a hold of one of those books, and you do, you'll do just fine, okay? Not going to spend too much time with these bulbs over here. They're kind of, they, they're not old. You still see a lot, a lot, a lot of them around, okay? Typical bulbs that have been around for years, okay? Watts, 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 amps, amps, amps. When I do my electrical courses, I have about eight pages of different bulbs, these type of bulbs over here. You, you name it, guys. You, you, you know what I'm talking about, you know, uh, 1157 and uh, 1156, 194s, all of them, okay? And what happens is, it's so easy to make a mistake. I've actually gotten into some of these over here. The first time I ran into that, I'm trying to find a bulb. Oh, geez, I should have one like that on the shelf. I don't have one. So I went on my computer on the parts I'm set up to go directly like with Napa. And uh, I go on there, and I believe it was a GM product. What it doesn't matter. And I'm over there. It's like I'm searching for the bulb vehicle that 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 SUV or whatever I had in shop was sitting there waiting for a lousy bulb, so we can pass an inspection. And believe it or not, that particular GM product is the only one that utilized that bulb. I'm I, like, you've got to be kidding. Why can't I mean? You, after a while, it's like, you know, you got a hundred bulbs. It's, it's kind of like, you know what, hey, buy that bulb from me, buy that bulb from me. I'm gonna lock you up, it has to be that bulb. Well, there's more to it than that. Engineering-wise, everything has to kind of mix. And those of you who are old like me, you know having the right taillight bulb and years ago when the Chrysler products affected your ABS and so on. But over here, yeah, engineers, yeah, you're right, and you're right. We can have some good conversations on that. Now, what percentage of an LED cannot be working? Right now, they, they are working on that, okay? In the United States, we do not have a percentage of LEDs to say, say you got a nine LED light, if two of them out, there is no regulation saying that this light is bad. Now, I'm gonna tell you right now, they are working regulatory-wise and come up with some kind of a figure. So, for example, if that vehicle comes in on the roadside you, you, and it's got, say, like, you know, six of the nine working, it's not a violation. It's not whatever. New York State, I, I don't know where you're uh, asking that question from, okay, Ron, but uh, in New York State, they're actually working on that too. Up to this point in our annual inspection, New York State kind of meets the requirements, you know, with 23, the total of 23 states altogether, they've adopted a lot of the federal regulations. But New York State, with the lights, they made it very stupidly simple. In New York State, when it comes to lights, it says all lights have to work correctly. So the bottom line is, for all these years, and I checked with the DMV, if I have one light LED bulb, or LED, yeah, bulb exactly inside that lamp, out that light is not working correctly is it it's not working the way it should you know that's not the way it was designed it needed all of them working and to be honest with you they needed them for basically to meet all the lumens requirements and there's a process you know, a candela process they do when they try to meet the 108 processes now what happens is most states will have a vehicle in traffic law that also states that Anybody should be able to see that light and, and I'm just gonna give you some stupid numbers You know between five to five hundred feet it should be visible so in a traffic portion of it with a vehicle traffic law You can get nailed out there if somebody makes that judgment call. So I hope that uh, answers that question so what happened was 
these have been around forever and ever especially these 1157s so companies truck light they made a huge change they took this bulb here and they put it in this sealed kind of a lamp that give you a little bit of history okay and they got it if you ever open this up it's kind of like on a spring load in here so that really sealed it shock proof and a lot of stuff so we've come a long way from these and of course you see a lot of your smaller vehicles the sprinters and everything else we get there every day i'm changing about two or three of those halogen type of bulbs you know so halogen bulbs the previous ones they're all tungsten the halogen also just so you know it also is a tungsten filament it's encased inside a small quartz envelope inside the quartz envelope are halogen gases when the bulb is at operating temperature halogen gas combines with the tungsten bottom line is okay and they vaporize and deposit them on filament the filament can run at higher temperatures making it possible to get more light per unit of energy so it only makes sense you know to have that as a headlight and so on eh? now just so you know they do produce a lot of heat much higher temperature temperatures compared to normal incandescent and if you talk to people you know everybody's always over there if I take this halogen bulb over here don't lose your fingers and all this stuff <laughs> you know what I'm gonna tell you guys you know I try not to do that but boy the way these I'm gonna say what Ryan got on the chat box engineers I I cannot believe the song and dances you have to go through on some of these vehicles to change a freaking headlight bulb the headlight bulbs do not last forever and you get into some of these i mean you're lucky if you don't break some of the fascia clips and everything else and that's the one thing you know uh uh yeah i see that the one thing that i do not like and you're right with that fretting issues it's not just fretting okay anything internally and i'm going to get to that with the leds you know they do not like uh over voltage they do not like low voltage so we're going to move on here okay now we're going to get into leds i cut this one open here they're electrically charged semiconductor chip attached to a circuit board and inserted in a lamp these lights have become standard on today's vehicles. They're long life, low current, draw makes these ideal for transportation industry. The instantaneous response compared to incandescent time, the response meaning that if I step on that brake, that person is gonna see that brake come on much faster than in the old incandescent where, again, it's not one of those things where it's like, you're going to put a stopwatch to it but again recognizing that vehicle in front of me is going to stop that incandescent bulb had to what had to light up get hot and everything else the filament before we would do and then and again i'm talking about it longer than it actually actually it happens like this okay but anything you create 80 to 20 feet of additional stopping distance stopping distance is huge if you've if you've gone through any of my brake courses or if you've gone through any of the breaks i've done in lunch and learns you know we got regulations on stopping distances to for commercial vehicles okay and of course 85 percent reduction load electrical systems okay minimizes voltage drop okay and of course in this picture over here if you zoom in a little bit you can see how nicely they're encapsulated here you will see resistors in here and I'll get into that in a short here okay now they convert electrical current directly into light photons they're highly efficient because there is no heat loss there it, it, that's not necessarily true they consume a fraction of the power of conventional bulbs they illuminate at faster speeds leds are used mainly for illumination and indication okay illumination is like you're straightforward i want to illuminate something indication is like hey i just put the stoplight on i just put the turn signal on how about illumination on the dash hey my switch just came on your led comes on says yep hey it's on okay now one disadvantage lack of heat makes them more susceptible to ice and snow and that's been a concern for years okay all diodes just so you know and i'll get back to this in a little bit all diodes produce some electrical response when subjected to light photodiodes are designed to detect light electric constants for leds resistance affects brightness voltage affects brightness 
very important. There is a limit to how much voltage resistance. Exceeding the limit can destroy the LED. This is guys almost a lot of work, okay? Typical current tends to be 20 milliamps to possibly 30 milliamps per LED. And I'm giving you a broad range here, guys. I'm not gonna cast anything in stone. You get your meters out there and you'll see I'm pretty damn close with some of that stuff. Now, the previous slide said something about heated, right? Recognizing that that is an issue, okay? Truck light came up with a heated LED light, heating element to prevent ice and snow buildup. Eh? Now, I'll give you some specs because you guys are all techie guys over here, okay? That's one thing I've learned throughout all these months of doing this. Okay? So I wanna make sure we throw some tech stuff in here. Just so you know, okay? Three and four pin integral plug, three pin stop, turn, tail, four pin stop tail turn with backup in case you're wondering what these all mean. Of course, everything works on 12.8 volts. Of course, sitting still, you're gonna be more than that when you're running. Now, guys, this, current draw with heater on, with heater on. Take a look at this, the tail, 0.55 amps, 0.65 amps, stop, 0.6. Guys, that's hardly no draw at all, considering you got a heater on there. Just so you know, the heater is self-regulating. Heater is always powered, adjust output depending on temperature, okay? PTC base will automatically turn on as temperature drops, okay? Polycarbonate lens and housing, same light pattern output as existing products, flange or grommet mount, okay? Now, this PTC thermistors, okay? are often used in LED lighting applications to control the current. This is typically done in the driver's circuit. The reason they do that is it's used to protect the LED from overheating and also controls the LED current as a function of temperature. Now, what is a PTC? PTC stands for positive temperature coefficient. In a PTC thermistor, resistance increases as the temperature increases. They are typically used to protect electronic circuits from high temperatures. Now, those of you that have worked forever in the automotive field and stuff, okay, uh, Gino, I know you have, you've been through a lot, a lot of the classes and stuff. What happens is that you know the NTC, where have you seen it? In this particular case, resistance decreases, temperature increases. Very, very, very useful trying to figure out temperature measurement or also used for temperature control. Here it is, guys. Engine coolant temperature and so on. Okay. Just so you know, I'm not doing a, I'm not doing a uh, EV or class or anything like that, but just so you know, okay, positive temperature coefficient PTC heaters. What the hell are you talking about? Used in EVs, when power is applied to a cold PTC heating element, it has a low resistance. Drawing a large current, as it heats up, the resistance increases and current draw decreases. PTC will stop drawing current if it overheats, it only draws the current it needs to maintain temperature. It's funny how all these concepts get utilized in all sorts of different ways. And once you, you know, uh, once you uh, get comfortable with like all the inputs, sensors, and everything, you're gonna find out it doesn't matter if it's on a car, if it's on a truck, no matter what portion of the vehicle you're in, they have so many commonalities, okay? So let's go on. Now, truck lights, okay? Now, just so you know, Dorman Products has a lot of headlights, okay? They're the halogen direct fit headlights but truck light because they're they've been so into the leds you know they've been into it for years a uh, little bit of history on the leds uh uh there was this guy named uh, nick halnack while working at ge he developed the first practical visible spectrum red led okay and 1991 truck light actually released the first led stop lamp to commercial motor vehicles and just so you know today truck light is the fourth largest just think about it everything you i don't care you got led tvs you got everything else 
Can you imagine how huge a lighting market is if they're the fourth largest user of LEDs in the world? I mean, that's huge, guys, you know, so. But anyway, they came out with this plug and play heated option. Heats constantly under the degrees, unique heat patterns to prevent sun. So now we're actually able to get, you know, uh, heated headlights. I gotta tell you, uh, I ran in a situation where uh, I had a customer, he decided to go out and get a uh, LED headlights. And he put it, I believe it was in a Kenworth. Uh, but it, the Kenworth wasn't set up to do that. When he put the lights on, the daylight running lights, the headlights would kind of flicker and flash. Now, he he got into trouble. He got pulled over inside the road. He actually got issued a ticket because if you look at the vehicle traffic laws, I don't care what state you're in or whatever, you're not supposed to have headlights flashing. That's a no-no, okay? So he got ticketed for that, and I believe he got a roadside violation. So, But he bought the lights himself, and uh, uh, the quick answer is, you know, I told him, I said, it's just like your, your computerization, unless probably somebody could reprogram it, wasn't meant to take that kind of a current fluctuations and stuff you know and that's not what you guys might be thinking right now that don't you have a have a resistor in there that's true too but we'll get to that in a second okay? so now uh, what I'm basically doing here is I have a LED I'm not so sure if you can see it but I have a but this is genuinely LED it's a LED light now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on or Brian is gonna turn on my power, uh, <laughs> my old uh, light that I used to use for uh, overhead projector. So go ahead, turn it. Just the mere fact we put some light in there generated a voltage. You can see it over here. So, not sure what I'm trying to do. But I'm probably, probably trying to invent a battery or <laughs> some kind of a. <sighs> you know, maybe I can get rich and. Uh, you know, maybe I can help out the utility companies, get a bunch of these diodes and stuff, and I can start, you know, lighting up cities and stuff. Just kidding, guys. You know, <laughs> it's charging, whatever. So anyway, now, this, I want to walk through here a little bit. When these lights came under a computer control, okay, it was a, and I still think it's wrong, okay? But the first time I had one of these vehicles come in, I don't even remember what it was. All your life, all the years I've worked on, driver is in the middle of a hot load. He comes in, my whatever, turn signal, taillight isn't working. A no-brainer. You go over to your shelf, you get a freaking bulb, you put it in, it's either gonna work or not. If the bulb didn't do it, right? Because don't forget, this driver's got a load. This driver needs to go down the road. Can't fiddle fart around, okay? If it wasn't that, you just go in there. Do I have ground? Do I have power? Nothing complicated. So if you don't have power or you don't have ground, the easiest way to do that without getting overcomplicated, especially if it's a tail end in the back, I keep telling my classes, you know what? Get comfortable with visually start looking for areas that are susceptible to touch this, do this. You know the green stuff. Um, preaching to the choir here guys you guys that work on all this stuff you know what exactly what I'm talking about so all of a sudden here comes this truck in and it's got a hot load listen I'm in the middle I got a window time I got to get to this other state over here yeah no problem it's a no-brainer I go over there I went over there I'm doing the light guess what do exactly what I said switch the bulb ain't working now this time I'm looking around I'm looking in the back okay there's like four or five freaking wires coming in there i'm like what the hell is going on over here so i'm tracing the wires going back it's going in this little box over here it's like oh what are we doing now where do i go with this thing now i gotta figure out what's going in what's going out what's doing what and the bottom line was this guys that I did figure it out and it took me a while, okay? I didn't have no information or anything and it was that controller in there that was the problem. So I get on the phone, listen, I need one of these. I'll give you the VIN number of the truck and everything else. Oh, sorry, we don't have one. 
what are you going to tell this driver, okay, you don't have no stoplights, you don't have this and everything, eh? because this expensive electronic controller isn't available right now, it has to get overnighted in and everything else, it's like, why? Okay, and I'll tell you why, because throughout the years, our vehicles have started to get, utilize more and more amps, more energy, whatever way you want to look at it, okay, not to mention the comfort creature of when that driver sits there, instead of doing a pre-trip, okay, that little light comes on the dash or indicator or wordage, hey, your left marker light is out, whatever the case, your left tail light, everything. Guy never had to go out, the computer gives that feedback and tells the driver, you know what, they can all be happy with that, but don't cry if your truck is sitting there for a long time, you know. They could have found different alternatives. This is my two cents, okay. I get, I get the computers for engines, injectors, and all this stuff. I mean, I grew up with that transition going from mechanical to computerization. You wouldn't have the high mileage vehicles that you have today. I come from an era of 25,000 miles. Try to sell your car, try to sell this, you know. I mean, clean vehicles, it works, speech done, okay. So anyway, here's a little bit of quickie. I can't, now I picked on a Freightliner M2 to walk through these, okay. Uh, just to make sure, okay, uh, I can't cover everybody's kind of controllers and stuff, but I'll do the best just get you basically into, and they all somewhat work the similar, so that's where I'm coming from over here. So in the fre Freightliner, you have a bulkhead module, module, excuse me, it's the primary module of the Freightliner M2. This bulkhead module controls the operation of the other multiplex modules in their system and a variety of other vehicle components. Now, you know if you work on cars or anything else there is a wake and state uh, sleep state excuse me uh, the Balkan module and we're gonna get to the chassis module an instrument control unit I see you are in an awake state or a sleep state again depending on vehicle condition so this is just an example awakening any of these components will wake up the remaining components up if they are not already awakened okay so real fast you have it in your hand also, waking up you open the door, turn on hazard switch, turn ignition switch, any position other than off, turning on the headlight, okay, depression service brake. Now I'm awake. Sleep state, both the bulkhead chassis, ICU will enter sleep state when no longer actively, actively controlling any outputs or responding any inputs. So that's the two things here. Now, in the bulkhead module, the following light related components are controlled by the uh, bulkhead module. This is the bulkhead module, the dome lamp, left high beam, left low beam, clearance lamp, tail license plate trailer, okay? And in your handouts, if you ever wanted to know and check this out, I actually threw you in some amps here. In blue are the maximum allowable current load, so you can do your amp reading if some, why is, why is my fuse blowing and so on. And we'll get into a different type of virtual fuses and relays. In blue are the maximum, again, what can happen if the amps get exceeded, how would you read the amps? So now, here's a perfect example. Remember I talked about tractor front park light malfunction. Display show park light malfunction, both front markers not working. Perfect example, controllers used for eliminating lights. Recognizing, the controller recognized an issue and displayed the issue. There is no relays or fuses here, guys. Eh? Now, there is, they're called virtual ones. The it, problem was, it was the right side marker was a culprit, too much amp drop, putting the controller into overcurrent protection mode. The fix was go out there, get a $140 marker replacement. Okay, now both sides worked. Remember previously, none of them worked in the front. So now, let's get to this chassis module. Takes orders from the bulkhead module, provides power flow circuit protection to the various components of the M2, also reports its input and output states to the bulkhead module. Maximum allowable current load is exceeded, the chassis module software will shut off the affected output pin or group of pins. Okay. Now the chassis module, remember on the bulkhead was left light headlights and so on, on the chassis module is the right low beam turn turn right, 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 right. So if you go through this, you can see the lights got split between the two modules, 
Okay? So before I put it all together, just so you know, okay, typical of computers, you have virtual fuses and breakers. These devices are used in the chassis controller circuits. They take the place of those old electromechanical circuit breakers. There's an overload event, the virtual circuit protection device, device trips without any actual physical action, you know, blowing the fuse and opening up the circuit breaker. Virtual circuit protection devices can be programmed also to perform the same as electromagnetic counterparts. The other thing you have in there, you have what's called the field effect transistors, FETs. They're electronic relay switches. They're perfect complement for circuits with what we call smart switches. I'll get to that. They can be used either as a switch or an amplifier. Positive charge to the gate. The base permits electron flow without any moving parts. Okay, it's basically a relay without moving parts. Okay, low current controlling high current. Now, switches. They tend to be used in multiplex systems. Switches are capable of broadcasting switch status onto the data bus, also known as ladder switches because they contain a ladder resistance. Processor receiving data from the ladder switch has a library of resistor values. Again, your controller is nothing but a memory bank in there. There's a library in there, okay? Smart switch typically has a LED to indicate that a switch request has been affected. Smart switches can be toggled. They could be multiple or they also could be momentary style. Module broadcasting to a data bus is designed to self-check smart switches. Now, a continuation of the previous and signal a fault if one is detected. I ran out of room on that slide. So for example, terminal corrosion resistance or loose wire is determined by analyzing the ladder bridge resistances. The systems knows the system know it and possibly locate it. Look, smart tip, disconnect the smart switch, will log a code immediately, use the system self-diagnostics, locate a problem. So let's put this together because I'm anxious to get to a board. We're running out of time a little bit. So now here you look. I put a smart switch over here. Here's my bulkhead module. Here's my chassis module. Okay, you got the chain 1939. Here's your, you know, uh, data bus going back and forth. This has your, uh, oh, geez. Man, I get under pressure when the clock starts, but these, here's your fuse box for the, uh, I'll get to that, I'll, that word will come to me, you know, but everything powers these two guys up over here because I don't want to lose track of here. Now, if you see here in this particular case, the bulkhead module has what? The left headlamp low beam, the left headlamp high beam. Who's got the right headlight? The chassis module, right? Right headlamp, low beam, right hand, okay? So let's do this. Let's walk through this. You, you have the picture in your handout. When the headlamp switch is turned on, the bulkhead module senses the input. Bulkhead module is programmed to know which outputs to activate and where the outputs are located. You know, whether they be in a bulkhead module, chassis module, or any other controller. In this case, the output for the left headlamp, low beam, are located in a bulkhead module. Output for the right are in the chassis. Bulkhead module directly activates the left headlamp because the right headlamp low beam outputs on the chassis, right? So it's going to send a message over the chain 1939 to the chassis module to tell it to activate those outputs. Once the chassis module receives the message, it activates correct output, sends a message. Why did we do that? Why did they do that? makes all the sense. This design allows at least one headlight to work even if one of the modules fails. Now that portion of it I like, okay? So power distribution module, that's what I was thinking about, that little red thing over there. Now if you look, there's, there's a couple ways they work this. You might see one with the relays in there. This has no relays, okay? And this one has the low current smart switches in there. Multiplexing, basically multiple control modules communicate with each other, low current switch signals to activate a feature such as lights in this case. Yeah. And then of course, if you got still have a hard wire fuse and relay, PDM power distribution module uses fuses and relays. So depending on the year and you know of the vehicle and so on, you can still see a mixed match of a lot of this stuff here. Okay. Now the biggest thing with lights is to avoid any problems and issues to begin with. Okay. 
it starts with good maintenance good inspections and so on so that means and again i'm preaching to the choirs you guys know when you get into the wiring and stuff what a freaking mess and where the connections come together and everything that corrosion control is so huge okay uh truck light actually just came out with a I, and i've used their little uh goopy stuff for years it's worked pretty good but this actually cleans it and protects it and prevents and everything else so really avoid the limiting light filers minimize corrosion seal and or use seal harness connectors don't poke into the wires use the proper gauge wires i don't have time i was gonna do something on that too don't start truck with lights on a lot of guys don't realize that why you got voltage surges. Lights do not like under and over voltages, believe it or not. Okay, poor grounding, dedicated ground through seal and harness is always preferred. Guys, I don't have to tell you, spaghetti wiring is not uncommon in trucking. Okay, and of course, this can always open up the door for discussion and best practices. I'm gonna put the slide here on, or we're not ready yet. I really wanna get into uh, into the board over here so if you can zoom in over here uh hopefully i can do something real fast because i i love the hands-on kind of kind of stuff over here so i have a led light over here okay and i have a resistor that's the way they're designed in here uh you can't see it real good here but uh if you zoom in a little bit without losing it these are all led lights over here and every one of them has a resistor in here okay and one by the way one resistor can can handle multiple leds so what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn this on and are you zooming in pretty good uh a little bit closer so they can see the light come on okay. virtually this is one led bulb it came on right so let me do this let me put my everybody is comfortable with voltage drops right uh if you can see this meter now I'm really got the pressure on. You guys are lucky I didn't use that word. <laughs> so I have that on and I'm gonna take a voltage drop reading of just that light. This light dropped 2.21 volts. Point being is it doesn't take much to turn these lights on, which is a nice feature. So I'm gonna go on my resistor here and that's 10.85 you do the math and what are we going to wind up having we're going to have this okay now the other thing i'm going to flip this around okay i'm going to put this over here and i got the switch off i'm going to put this on i'm going to put this on and i'm going to flip this on okay no light what happened LED. It's a diode. The D is for a diode. What's a diode? It's a one-way check valve. Does that make sense? So let me see what other kind of trouble we can get here with the time amount of time we got. Okay, I'm gonna set this one up here for amps. I'm gonna hopefully I'm not gonna be so kind of going crazy here. I'm gonna take this LED, not, not not LED, my regular conventional lamp, okay, and I'm gonna wire it up, okay. I'm gonna put my lead over here like this, and I already preset my meter, my leads. They are in an amp pocket over here, okay. And last time I did a diagnostics, I made sure everybody understands. Make sure you switch the pockets. So I'm gonna turn this into a counter an electron counter and i'm going to put this here and i'm going to put this here over here and i'm going to turn it on and can you zoom in on the meter over here a little better my light came on and i'm drawing roughly around two amps guys so this one light took two amps by the way the reason i like doing this if you're not comfortable with meters gives you another chance hey what did he do over here you know now i'm going to do something else here okay. now i'm gonna take this led light over here okay this led now i'm gonna put my amp meter on there okay i'm gonna put this into red okay. 
this is where it's get, I get in a hurry, guys. I'm going to tell you right now. I'll probably screw something up. I'm going to let the smoke out someplace. Okay. I'm going to put this over here. Same thing. I'm basically putting this meter in, in as part of the circuit. I'm going to draw it, turn it on. My LED light came on. Now, it says 0.137. Now, I originally had it on my amps over here. I always do that to be a safe side. If I never know how much amp is going to draw because I don't want to blow the fuse here, here I'm going to feel very comfortable putting it into milliamps. And I'll be very honest with you, I'm going to feel comfortable putting it into my milliamp pocket. And right there, okay, 133.3 milliamps. Okay, again, nice way of doing it. So, moving on over here, okay? one of the problems we have because we got such low current over here, and guys, I'm probably run five minutes late. If you got to stop, let me know. Uh, I just give me five minutes, I'm trying to finish this up over here uh turn turn this on to me i'm gonna try to finish it up if you gotta kick off that's okay this will be a recording that'll come on i think chi doreen you guys usually put it on within a day or two it goes on youtube so let me finish this up okay throwing stuff all over the place over here i set up this board over here if you notice let me turn this on real fast if i get to it doing multiple things this actually works i got my tail lights on i got markers on and you'll see my stop lights going on over here okay so i need to get this meter on if it doesn't come on okay it comes on so now i actually have this set up for turn lights also this came on but it's not flashing this side, this came on, this wasn't flashing, okay? I know, I know the problem is the bulb. I'm going to save you guys a little bit of a time here. The bulb is bad. Let me get the screwdriver. Okay. I was going to play some games with you guys, you know, with this... So I will pull this bulb off because I want to show you something. Easiest way because you got such low current to mess around with this stuff. It's hard to tell, you know, if a bulb is bad or good. Okay. I'm going to take this checker over here. Okay. Not that one here. Where did I, no, I needed to leave this on. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. I have adapters for everything. So I could have very easily put my little adapter on, go like this, okay, and check if my bulb is good or not. This is a good known bulb. I'm going to put this on real fast, okay, because I want to tell you right now, trying to diagnose this stuff is really, really hard. So I'll put this on to make sure that we do have everything working. I'll put that here so everybody can see it. Okay, I'll get this on over here so people can see that. Man, I almost could use a couple of hands once in a while here. In about a minute, I'm going to chuck this thing. Yes, I get frustrated just like all you guys do. You know, given this is all going to be on YouTube, I can't say the words I want to do. Let me sync my Curon over here. Okay, let me sync that while that's syncing over here. Now, point I was trying to make is turn signal isn't coming on. Okay, it's lighting, but it's not flashing. So for the sake of time, okay, what I'm going to do is... Uh, For the sake of time, I have this ground wire over here, okay, and this is my problem, okay. I have no voltage here, I can tell you right now. What happens is, this is the ground for my flasher. Now, if I pull this ground off, 
okay, and I turn it on, the light still came on, okay? Point being is, if I put my meter on here, okay, I put it on resistance, and I just look at the middle one over here, okay, because we're really pushing time here. This is open, right? We have an open wire. I know we have an open wire. Now, if I put this wire that is not open in here, it works. Why did I do that? Okay. So you're trying to work on a light. This vehicle comes in and this thing isn't working. And you're like, I don't understand this. This was on. It's not flashing. Okay, I'm going to try. Maybe it's the bulbs. You know, maybe it's the flasher unit, electronic flasher over here. And the whole problem was what, guys? This assembly needed to see to flash it needed to have this ground over here and that's the point I've been trying to make that when you get with these LED lights you cannot it, it's a little bit harder to diagnose these things you know uh, than it is other lights and I'm going to do one last thing now the way I have this set up over here okay might as well turn them on the way I have them set up over here is that I actually have a bulkhead here. I have a trailer cord over here. And here's another nif nifty tool, okay? So I have this little tool over here that I can plug in here, okay? Turn my lights off and I'll try to do it this way. Can you zoom in on this? Okay. Light came on, light came on, light came on light came on okay you see it flashing basically how often do you get a trailer in for example and it's like man is it my cord is it this because you always want that quick path you know to do your diagnostics this is yeah you can get your test light out and everything else but however you know uh whatever fast way you can do it is better look look guys uh what do I do with my clicker? I'm sorry I ran late. I, I, I tried to do a little bit too much over here. Uh, again, it is going to be online. It'll be, uh, Dorman will send it out. You know, it, it has all got recorded and everything else. Uh, as far as next week goes, I'm not, uh, next month, excuse me, I'm still trying to formulate something to do. I, I don't know, I might do something on a mission, something. The problem is trying to do something within an hour, it gets a little bit hard because I'm one of those guys, I, I want to cram 10 pounds of crap into a five pound pail and it don't always happen over here. And the stuff that I did like over here, it really, uh, uh, I try to utilize a lot of real world stuff that are problems I run into and so on and same way as you guys run over here so given with that if there's no questions there's one last thing one last slide over here uh, Dorman is very very good at providing these free trainings all day long stay on this slide Bob if you can so if anybody can do if you can zoom in a little better try to get this QR code in here and do a quick survey guys i really appreciate that uh i'm gonna call it hopefully you give it a real good survey and uh, uh i see the same names over and over and hopefully i get to see you guys again next month i'll figure out what we're gonna do you know i'm not going anywhere so if next month i break into tire steering suspension oh well but let's keep this going the more people that uh I notice the more clicks and people like it, it keeps me pumped up and will just keep on going. You know, it's a, it's a strange, good world we live in. Thank you. 